Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China's Space Interview Series, where we do interviews of key opinion leaders, of entrepreneurs, as well as just any person that is knowledgeable on the Chinese space industry. I'm Jean Deville of the Dongfang Hour, joined as always by my co-host, Blaine Curcio. And if you are new to this channel, in addition to interviews, we also do a weekly China space news coverage on YouTube, a monthly deep dive also into specific topics of the Chinese space industry on YouTube as well. And we also have a weekly newsletter and a brand new website all on Chinese space. Now back to our interview episode. This week, we are deviating from the norm of discussing Chinese space from a more technology and economic standpoint and going into a seldom explored topic, which is Chinese space culture. Now, what do we mean by Chinese space culture? Space culture refers to how Chinese society as a whole, from the younger to the older generations, how they perceive space. What does space evoke for them? It also refers to how space is ingrained into everyday life in China, from a space tea rocket ship in front of the Pizza Hut to McDonald's collaborating with the Chinese Lunar Exploration Program, all the way to real estate companies investing massively into space-themed attraction parks, all of these things. And of course, very importantly, it also refers to how the government considers space and the narrative that's given to the development of the Chinese space industry. And so today we are going to dig into all of that fun stuff. And if that's not enough, we are joined this time by an extra special guest, which is the esteemed lecturer, researcher, and all around cinephile, Molly Silk. Molly, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Indeed, welcome, Molly. And just to give a very brief background of our esteemed guest. So Molly is a doctoral researcher at, in science, technology, and innovation policy at the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research, or the MIOIR, or possibly M-I-O-I-R. I don't know how that will be pronounced normally. As well as an associate lecturer in Asia-Pacific Studies at the University of Central Lancashire. Her main research interests include China's space policy and diplomacy, U.S.-China relations and technological competition, as well as areas such as emerging technologies and the commercial space sector. Molly holds a Master of Arts in Translation and Interpreting Studies in Mandarin Chinese from the University of Manchester, and she has previously worked as a China Science Technology Policy Analyst as well in UN institutions where she undertook translation work and research. So just echoing Jean's point, welcome, Molly. And first question um, I would like to ask, it's a little bit... Uh, a little bit potentially politically incorrect, but I can't help but notice that you don't seem to be Chinese, and uh, I, I suppose you probably were not born in China. So if I can ask, what got you into China and the Chinese space sector more generally, and uh, what was that like? Sure. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I'm not Chinese. I wasn't born in China. I was born in the UK. I suppose I look quite British. Um uh, with the hair and the you know, very pale skin. Um, so, well, I, when I was a teenager, I was really lucky. Um, I was able to visit um, China um, for about a week. Um, and when I was there, um, I just was so uh, struck by how like different it was from um, my own culture. Um, you know, I couldn't understand anything you know, with the writing. Um, also, just what I was told about um, you know, different cultural aspects of China and political aspects. I just all found it so um you know, so, uh, for lack of a better word, alien, <laughs> very strange. Um, and I just, um, you know, from then on, I just kind of always felt like I needed to go back and, um, you know, understand a bit more um, this place and this culture. Um, and so that's why I decided uh, to take up uh, Chinese studies at university, because I just wanted to be able to you know, understand as much as possible. Um, so that's that's kind of what got me into um, Chinese, uh, Chinese studies and learning about that. Indeed, it is definitely a totally uh, alien world in, in many ways from uh, from you know growing up in the West. So, uh, thanks very much for the for the intro. So maybe we can get into the uh, the first topic at hand. So that is Chinese space culture. And so, uh, Jean, do you want to take us there for some Chinese space culture related topics? Absolutely, I'll fire off the first question. Um, so, um, space is quite a thing, I think, in the West, in the U.S., in Europe. Um, and one question we had was in China: Do you know, how frequently does an everyday Chinese person encounter a space reference in his life? And is is space a thing in China, just more generally? Hmm. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's definitely become much more of a thing um, in recent years, um, particularly in just the last decade. Um, and it's certainly um, seeped more into the general consciousness of Chinese people. Um, so, of course, um, you know, if you're interested in space, you're bound to try and seek out space related you know, activities and news um, and you know, artifacts. Um, but I suppose just kind of 
again, generally, as you ask, um, for the average Chinese person who perhaps doesn't have um, your know, major uh, interest in space. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot more science fiction uh, being released um, you know, in recent years that are kind of uh, have themes to do with space. Um, we also have uh, the Space Day of China, um, which is now a, a common occurrence every year. And so this is something that is promoted you know, nationally. Um, also, we're seeing a lot more um, you know, space related uh, topics taught within schools um, and a lot more commercial products rather just kind of exploding onto the market. Um, also, when we look at the kind of events and, and spaces that are being uh, constructed, um, you know, we've just seen uh, Shanghai has got a new planetarium, which is, uh, so they claim, uh, the, the biggest uh, planetarium in the world. Um, so all these different things kind of put together um, are really um, creating a lot more opportunities for Chinese people to get involved in kind of space uh, and kind of cultivate more knowledge and awareness of uh, the space industry, particularly China's own space industry. And for, from what I understand, these a lot of these new space uh, references and, and places, they're rather new. And what do you think triggered this shift from, you know, maybe moderate interest in space, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago to you know, significant interest today. What was uh, was there a trigger, or is it just you know a slow process of? Uh, yeah. um, so that's a really interesting question, and I think it's um, I think it's quite difficult to say, and um, I'm not sure what your thoughts are on it. Um, but uh, certainly, when I started um, my research on this back in 2008. There were still you know, very few um, kind of artifacts uh, around, um, and uh, you know, kind of in just the last few years, um, like I say, there's been an explosion um, of uh, you know, commercial products and you know, advertisements and, and things like that. Um, but there seemed to have been a shift, um, sort of at the um, kind of say about six years ago, around like 2014. Um, and I think some of the main reasons uh, for this kind of heightened interest in space um, perhaps uh, would have been a result of increased confidence um, of China um, and the Chinese government, Chinese people in their space program. Um, so around you know 2014, 2013, 2014. Um, which has seen uh, Shenzhou 10 um, launch. That was in the summer of 2013. So, you know, again, this was something that China had already done. They'd already put, um, you know, crews of people into space. This was, uh, they seemed quite confident at it at this point. Um, also, we saw Chang'e 3 land on the moon. So finally, China had a, a presence on the moon. And I think perhaps in the, the minds of um, the Chinese people, perhaps the you know, government actors, there was this linking now. It was, well, if we can put something on the moon and we also have people in space, then the next stage is to just get people on the moon, um, which is something that is, you know, for, for a long time been considered um, the sort of pinnacle of um, human you know, space uh, exploration and, and achievement of putting um, humans on the, the surface of the moon. Um, so I think perhaps that um, was a factor um, or why there's, there's been an increased interest in uh, space. Also, um, we begin to see, of course, when Xi Jinping came to power, he really put an emphasis on telling China's story and creating this, um, you know, using culture um, to communicate um, you know, ideas and, uh, and narratives uh, to the rest of the world. Also using it, you know, as a to enhance patriotism. Um, and so I think perhaps, um, you know, this kind of general shift towards culture being quite an important aspect sort of you know, seeped into um, you know, the, the space arena as well. And this is perhaps why we begin to see, you know, a lot more cultural interest in, in space. Um, but that's just kind of my two cents on, on the matter. Um, mm. Well, that definitely makes a lot of sense. And another question that's, you know, for a future conversation might be, with the commercialization of Chinese space starting around late 2014, to what extent has you know having commercial companies with commercial incentives increased the impetus by the space industry to increase their outreach? Let's say so. For example, as a topic we'll get into later, uh, you know, Space City making a partnership with Pizza Hut to try to have a rocket ship. Um, I don't know how likely it is that Cask would go out of their way to have a partnership with Pizza Hut. So again, having these commercial companies that are a bit more creative, let's say in their PR. Um, Again, an interesting topic for maybe a future time. Um, so definitely interesting to get the the sort of high level overview of, of what is space's role in, in China today. Um, I think we can maybe go into a bit more of the, the core of the Chinese space industry culture and spirit. And uh, Molly, you recently wrote a really interesting article in The Diplomat talking about Chinese space culture in which you talked about the spirits of Chinese space. Um, these being kind of the core elements that make up the foundation 
of the Chinese space sector, kind of the lore, the history, all of these things. So could you give us a brief overview of what are those spirits and then maybe, you know, what is their function? What yeah, what is why are they why do they exist? Sure. Um, I think that's a really interesting word to use that the lore of um, you know the, the Chinese space program or the national space program, certainly. Um, and so, yes, these spirits um, are kind of discussed and are seen now um, beginning to emerge a, a lot more. I think they're being publicized a bit more. Uh, so they kind of refer to these key times or periods uh, within the development of the Chinese space program. Um, and they also come attached with these like underlying values um, sort of drove the periods or these periods of development forward. Um, so I think um, from what I understand um, from the kind of discourse around this is that they're still in development. Um, you know, there's kind of just proposing or government actors are proposing um, kind of new almost key points of development each time. So we're seeing um, you know, discussion around um, creating a lunar uh, space spirit to kind of represent um, you know, China's uh, landing on the moon and this being like a key stage in their achievement. Um, so the ones I, I wrote about, um, so the first one was this idea of a traditional space spirit. This uh, kind of mainly refers to the beginning of the Chinese space program. Um, so when it started out, but also the, the name um, sort of indicates um, kind of a longer standing uh, links to China's traditional you know, history. Then we have the two bombs, one satellite uh, spirit, which refers to um, you know, the, the period when China first achieved um, you know, a successful atomic bomb and in, intercontinental uh, ballistic missile tests. Um, sorry, I can't say it. It's a very uh, weird word to say. Very interesting thing to celebrate in one's lore, but <laughs> yes, uh, you know, exactly. such, such, is, such is life, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the third one being this uh, crude or, or manned um, you know, space uh, space achievement. Um, so again, these kind of come attached with these, um, I think, seem to i think they're a bit abstract these these underlying kind of um values or principles and often these are um things like uh you know um mother uh, sorry love of the motherland or self-reliance um courage unity cooperation um you know just to kind of say well this is how we managed to achieve this it's through these um different um principles or, or values so essentially yeah so um these space spirits give um, direction to the kind of narratives um, and, and um, the cultural developments that are um, surrounding the space program. And it gives like a cultural grounding to Chinese space exploration in general. Um, you know, it legitimizes these endeavors um, within the wider national culture through the establishment of historical links and, and principles, um, I would say. <laughs> I, I wonder how impactful <clears throat> this sort of communication is with, um, with the Chinese population. Um, I think it's it's very China specific, right? I remember in June 2021, there was this high level delegation from the Chinese space industry, you know, top people from Chang'e, from the Tianwen missions, um, Beidou, et cetera. They came to Hong Kong, they gave presentations. So I went through most of those presentations. And so they're hour and a half long presentations at Hong Kong universities. And a lot of them, they did spend like 10 minutes, literally, discussing these spirits. And so I'm wondering, like, if I'm a student in that room and I'm listening to that, how impactful is that? Um, I guess from a, maybe from a Western standpoint, it, the, maybe not that much, not there, maybe not that much, um, you know, echo for me, but I, do, do you know how, how the Chinese respond to this kind of communication? Um, so I, um, I unfortunately have not been able to um, get a lot of research or do a lot of research involving the reactions of um, I think Chinese people to these spirits. Um, so my research has sort of been kind of trying to make sense of them because also from a Western perspective, I was a bit um, confused at first and I was uh, you know, thinking, oh, what's the point of these? They seem almost um, a bit arbitrary. Um, but as you say, they're, they're becoming quite widely discussed and they seem quite important um, as sort of founding principles of the, the space program. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, I couldn't say for sure. I'm sorry. Um, I, can't, I don't have a... Great answer to your question there. Um, That's quite all right. That was a hard one. <laughs> no, but certainly, I, I'd certainly love to um, find out and do more um, research and discuss with Chinese people more about this and um, what they think of it. And just a last question on Chinese space culture uh, and it's sort of the lore, and then we can get more into uh, commercialization thereof. Um, so one of the interesting things about Chinese space programs in, in general is their naming. A lot of really cool kind of mythical Chinese names to, you know, Tianwan and to Yu Tu and the, these different uh, different projects. So um, I guess, do you have any, any kind of thoughts on what the 
you know, what the logic is to name these in such a way and also any kind of names that you think are particularly interesting or otherwise uh, noteworthy mm. or poetic, perhaps? Um, well, so to first kind of answer you, so to answer your first question. Um, so I I think that um, this uh, this use of um, traditional names or names that um, make reference to traditional Chinese culture are a way um, for government actors to link um, the traditional past of China with these very forward looking um, activities um, and kind of demonstrate that, you know, while China is uh, reaching for you know, space now, um, it'll never be disconnected from its uh, national roots and its cultural roots. Um, this development that we're seeing is a result of you know, a long lineage of, of culture and, and history. And so this uh, you know, new of venture into space is just following on from from this. I also think that um, linking uh, the past and, and the present is a way to um, strengthen the identity of um, these space programs and um, sort of define them as very distinctly and uniquely Chinese and kind of connecting uh, space to the country's cultural heritage um, sort of demonstrates that they're not just um, very clinical um, you know, pieces of equipment that they're putting up in space um, or copies of uh, their Western predecessors. They're um, very distinctly Chinese Chinese um, developments. Um, and uh, I think it's also showing um, to the Chinese people and also to the international community that space is not just the exclusive domain of the West. Um, and of course, here we see um, you know, Western technologies be given um, names relating to um, you know, uh, historical figures or, or mythological figures in you know, kind of uh, our history of civilization or Western civilization, you know, it's considered um, to be so at least. Um, and so China is essentially saying, well, our culture is now up in space and we are in space. Um, and so, so, yeah, space naming with Chinese characteristics. It's true that when, when, when you have and, and when you have exploration, you know, you have, you have China exploring, say, lunar craters or exploring Mars. You find out you realize that a lot of the landscape on the moon and on Mars are just named in, in, in maybe in Latin or, you know, after famous names uh of 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 you know western space history the von karman crater for example and um and i always found that the translations in chinese were a bit awkward so um they sound a bit awkward and so i think they it's, yeah it's also a bit of re a relief for the chinese to maybe have a a chen Trishan crater or or something like that definitely maybe moving on to to a little bit of pop culture space pop culture in, in china um so I, I find personally that space culture, and as mentioned in the introduction, is becoming more and more uh, omnipresent in, in China. Just to give one specific example, then I'd love to hear, Molly, some, some examples that you have in mind on your side. Um, one that, you know, maybe uh, struck me a little bit more was one time I was, it was two years ago, I was in the Shanghai Metro. And then there was this huge advertisement on the wall which was some sort of contest where you could scan a QR code and you had a chance to win basically um, an opportunity to record your voice and then put it into a, this would be saved onto a chip and then sent into space and your sort of your voice would be broadcast into space or something like that. And, um, and so, yeah, I found that very interesting. And, and the fact that it's in the Shanghai Metro, so you're really targeting everyday people um, and that the ad was just so big. Um, I found that fascinating. So that's just one example that comes to mind. I'm sure there are many more. Um, Molly, do you want to, you know, give our listeners a few, do you have any examples in mind also? Sure. Yeah, that's a really interesting example. I've not seen that one. That's, that sounds really exciting. I'd love to have my voice up in space. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I think there's been quite a lot of that, definitely commercialization. I know we'll probably talk about that a bit more. Um, but uh, one that I always, uh, always struck me was this, um, KFC competition and uh, you've probably seen it. it was launched last year um, and you could win like a little chip kind of, like little plate you know with like a, a rocket on it like an official um, cask prize um, and then also the big prize was that you could win a trip to uh, see a launch at one of the, the space um, you know, launch, launch sites which I thought was really cool um, so I think yeah like kind of competitions and interactivity like that is something that we're beginning to see quite a lot of which I think is you know, a good marketing tactic um, in, in many different centers um, one thing that I, I've definitely observed is I, I think there's been an explosion of art um, and uh, design um, around um, the, the space program um, and, and China's space achievements. Um, so, of course, um, the, the Space Day of China um, every year, they, they have this competition and this post-competition um, 
which I'm, I'm sure you know of. And, and every year they, they pick a winner. It's a national competition. Um, and so you end up with um, you know, a beautiful piece of art that ends up winning. And I think my favourite was the one from 2019, um, which is kind of the, I think the most well-known one. Um, with the Psychedelic Tang- Chunga. Yes, that, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> that is an awesome, awesome, that is my favourite also, mm-hmm. yeah. It's incredible, yeah. Um, and uh, so you know, we have this competition every year, and then also um, the, the the government will publish um, all of the, these runners up, um, which you know there's so many wonderful, beautiful designs um, around uh, you know, these space achievements and using certain you know, motifs and, and you know, incorporating um, you know, whatever theme it is of the year, whether it's you know, trying to incorporate um, more traditional Chinese elements as well or um, more forward-looking ones. Um, and also, you know, we see a lot of artwork encouraged in children as well. So um, I think it was at the uh, uh, forum in Changsha um, in the opening ceremony. They showed a lot of artwork from children who had been asked to design what they kind of envisaged the future of China and space looking like, um, which was very interesting to see. I remember seeing one kid had drawn like a dragon um, spaceship, <laughs> which was really quite cool. Um, very, very Chinese. So, so yeah, I mean, lots of artwork and also you kind of go online and you see people, um, you know, designing, drawing, um, kind of, what's the word, uh, technologies, like uh, there's a lot of drawings of uh, very cutified, uh, you know, Chang'e, um, you know, Rover and, uh, and all these different, you know, artworks around the Taikonauts as well. So that's just one thing I've observed. And I think um, it's all very interesting. It's something I definitely like, you know, seeing. Um, I think another thing I'm sure we all um, recognize a lot is uh, science fiction. Um, and while I still think this is something that's being, in, you know, being developed, um, I think uh, there's a lot of sort of science fiction uh, now beginning to emerge around, um, you know, space themes, um, particularly these like big budget uh, movies. So, of course, we've got um, The Wandering Earth um, and then we have... Um, also, uh, th- this uh, new film, or I think it's a series, that's in production, um, which is you know the the three body problem, which kind of has uh, space themes as well. Um, so I think again, this sort of visualization of um, you know space and kind of showing um, China in space um, in art and on the big screen, you know, is something that's that's um, uh, quite interesting and I think quite impactful as well on on people's mindsets and how they view and envisage um, the future of China in space. Um, so, uh, uh, just, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Just also handling a camera problem that's coming yes, from yeah. Blaine and we're losing, he's coming in and coming out, but, um, that's fine. We can still continue the discussion. Um, and, and it, yeah, I think it's also fascinating how, you know, increasingly kids are also involved with a lot of the drawings that you mentioned at China Space Day, um, were a lot of kid drawings as well. Um, and to what extent do you think all this space pop culture is stemming from um, the government that's trying to have this uh, space popularization campaign? Or is it, do you think, more organic growth from a genuine interest from the, you know, the Chinese population? Mm. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it's something that's um, discussed quite a bit, you know, even in um, sort of uh, Western context as well. To what extent is it the government encouraging, you know, uh, an interest in space? And to what extent, as you say, is it uh, an organic growth? Um, and so I, I don't think that the people of China would be, um, you know, going to, to purchase things and, and get involved in these competitions um, and, and, you know, attend these different activities and launches if they weren't interested in you know, space to some extent. Um, but I certainly do think that the government has taken great steps to ensuring that there is an interest and ensuring that it's interesting as well. And uh, I think as we see, you know, we have um, CAS partnering with you know, different commercial entities. I think this is a, perhaps a way, as, as um, I think Blaine pointed out, these, these companies seem to be more creative um, in their outreach. Um, and so I think these kind of steps that the government are, or have been taking perhaps, you know, have had a, quite a strong role in, in the encouragement of this um, of this interest um so but yeah but for now i think uh, there's probably it's quite a bit of a, a balance you know there's a um you know this kind of increasing growth um and you know more of a demand for um you know space related content and so the government is quite keen to also continue to provide this and, and generate this interest in space and i would guess that also the, the the fact that commercial companies are involved you know they're, they're trying to sell space themed products the fact that uh, yeah, it's it's commercial. That's probably a hint also that there's genuine interest. I definitely agree with you that if someone's not genuinely interested, they're not going to buy, you know, um, long march themed um, <laughs> T-shirts or or anything like that. So so for sure. And um, 
And yeah, um, Blaine, do you have anything anything else on, on pop culture? Yeah, so just uh, a, a brief um, step back to the, the posters for China Space Day. I did notice that the 2021 poster was vastly more subdued, let's say, than 2019. And I can't help but wonder whether that's, uh, you know, somebody wants them to be a bit more conservative and the psychedelic Chang'e was just too too much or whether it's just completely coincidence and we're just reading too much into it. But yeah, that is definitely one of my favorite elements of Chinese space art is the uh, the China Space Day posters. Those are pretty epic. Um, so I guess talking a little bit more about the way that space is marketed or commercialized, um, I think one of the things that's worth looking at a little bit is the extent to which um, there's a lot of commercialization of space around and sort of pop culturization of space around young people. So you have a lot of um, sort of STEM education type of initiatives where, you know, a lot of students are, are starting to do space related activities there. Um, you also have, I suppose, the, as John mentioned earlier, these big kind of space themed uh, theme parks and other things that are being developed. Um, so do you have any any thoughts on just the, I guess, the significance of that and, and whether um, whether that is indeed the case from your perspective, I suppose? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think you're right that um, there's a real targeting towards um, the youth of China and, and you know, China's uh, you know, younger generations. And I think um, perhaps the reason for this is, is quite, I suppose, obvious in that you know, the government is trying to encourage uh, more of an interest in you know, space, in its, its younger generation for the purposes, um, so that they can then be the next generation of you know, engineers, scientists, um, you know, perhaps even have an interest in um, you know, the cultural side of it as well. Um, and, and just kind of continuing this uh, success, you know, through its, its younger population. Um, and I think focusing um, the education specifically um, a lot of the time on China's space industry, this perhaps, you know, gives the younger generation a, a sense of patriotism is perhaps, uh, you know, the, the best word for it, um, and a desire to contribute to China's own space endeavors. Um, so, for example, they, they may say, right, I want to stay here and, and help my country develop, you know, its space industry and, and um, you know, go further um, instead of perhaps you know, migrating to another country and helping theirs, um, for instance, um, or getting involved in a different company in a different country, for instance. And it makes me think of uh, another anecdote um, that I want to share is there, there was a live stream on CCTV for the docking of the Shenzhou 12 spacecraft um, to the Tianhe core module. And so very long live stream over, I think, two hours. And there was one part where they basically had a direct connection with uh, a school in Beijing, the the Bai Zhongxia, which is apparently a very high end middle school, and they had aerospace themed classes in mi middle school, and and these kids they basically um, had a direct discussion with some very high level cask engineer that was on the live stream asking questions about space. So I th uh, yeah, I found that very interesting that you know from middle school and probably even earlier on, there's already some um, campaign here to have. Um, you know, to, to have these students have contact with the space industry as, as early as possible. Oh, that's really interesting. Definitely, yeah. It reminds me of that uh, that survey, was it in the US and China, where you had in China, the number one answer to what mm. did kids want to be when they grew up was an astronaut. And in the US, it was a YouTuber, if I'm not wrong. And so I suppose uh, Jean and I are living the dream for US kids, but uh, <laughs> yeah, not yet Chinese kids. I, I don't see me being an astronaut anytime soon, but uh, glad to know that I'm apparently living the dream of my fellow countrymen. Um, and if you remember yeah. also, in I think it was in 2013, so it was Shenzhou 10, I think, there was um, the second Chinese female taikonaut, so uh, Wang Yaping. She did some sort of a physics lesson from the Tiangong 1 or Tiangong, Tiangong 1 lab that was live broadcast to the ground. And uh, again, that's trying to get kids involved into the space program. Um, yeah. Um, maybe just another, and, and then I'll stop with my anecdotes. Um, I, I, so I, I studied a bit aerospace in Toulouse. I also had an exchange, you know, in, in Beijing at, at the Beijing uh, University of Aerospace um, and, and Sciences. And basically, there were a lot of other Chinese students, obviously, studying aerospace. And I was quite surprised that that was in 2014, 2015. That's quite a few of them were not that much into working in the aerospace industry after their, you know, after they graduated. And the reason being, you know, that, um, that, that, you know, that would probably mean working for a state owned enterprise and, you know, the pay wasn't as impressive as if you joined maybe some of the higher end Chinese tech companies like Tencent or Alibaba and, and uh, you know, Xiaomi and all the others. Um, and so how effective do you think Molly is, is this campaign, from the government to try and enhance, uh, you know, the interest of Chinese students and, and, and youth 
for the space industry? And how do you think that has maybe that has changed also over the past years? Hmm. Um, well, so I think uh, there's definitely been an increase in the kind of education that um, your children and, and Chinese youth are receiving you know, around uh, space and and um, and I, I think um, because it's still quite early days, perhaps the impact of this remains to be seen. Um, so again, you know, with there being um, this sort of like explosion of you know educational activities and you know scholarships and, and summer schools and you know, the other kind of uh, activities that you've, you've all mentioned, um, I think the kind of people, the, the children or the youth of China that have been um, exposed to that are perhaps now um, you know deciding perhaps what they want to study at you know university or just kind of coming out of that. Um, and so I, I'd certainly be interested to, to see um, the kind of impact that that would, that would have. Um, sorry, I don't have an answer um, at the moment. But that's definitely an interesting question. I wonder if it will be um, effective. And I think it's a shifting question as well. You know, maybe in 2015, there wasn't that big of a s- development of commercial space in China. So maybe moderate interest. Um, and, you know, and maybe like more recently, there's been a crackdown on tech companies over the past couple of months. So maybe the interest for tech companies has also uh, diminished a little bit. So I, I guess this is moving waters and there's no, there's no straight answer to that um, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I recall, was it when we spoke with Kevin Shu of Landspace, he was mentioning that in the early days of Landspace, they had a lot of trouble attracting, you know, very top talent because they were really a startup in an industry that did not exist yet. And, you know, more recently they've been able to do a lot more aggressive recruiting from the top schools being a commercial space company, which has apparently become quite a bit sexier in China over the last few years. So yeah, that's uh, as you say, John. I think the phrasing was piles of CVs on his desk. Piles, yeah. <laughs> he had piles. So indeed, yeah, it's uh, changing times in the Chinese space sector. Um, maybe we can end uh, this episode with some rapid fire questions. So, Blaine, do you want to kick off a first rapid fire question? Sure thing. So, Molly, what are some sources that you'd recommend to uh, our listeners or viewers where if they would like to learn more about the Chinese space sector? Mm. Um, well, obviously, this podcast is a fantastic podcast. Well, thanks um, very much. <laughs> um, and uh, so I suppose it really depends on, um, you know, if the audience is able to uh, understand Chinese. Um, I think oftentimes, you know, there are many different Chinese sources that uh, illustrate um, you know, different um, uh, you know, activities or kind of what's going on. And, you know, I think it's quite good to get this you know, straight from the source. You know, there's a lot of different, um, you know, WeChat accounts and, um, you know, just kind of looking on um, very various websites related to Chinese news or if it's, um, you know, these Chinese companies. But of course, if, if um, one can't speak Chinese or understand Chinese um, to, to a certain extent, um, I certainly think that you know, Andrew Jones from Space News, he's on Twitter a lot and he seems to be very on the ball, you know, with um, you know, anything that comes out. He's you know, very rapid at um, you know, pushing out news on, on the space program. Um, so I think he would be um, also a go-to. Um, but of course, I think um, a lot of your listeners already um, are probably aware of, of Andrew. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's just kind of, you know, I, I perhaps don't have anything uh, extra special to share with anybody um, that probably don't already know about. Well, just a very quick follow up and then I'll turn it over to John for the next rapid fire question. You mentioned uh, WeChat accounts and just out of curiosity, do you also use Weibo or are you not so much for, for following Chinese um, uh, speech? Occasionally, yeah. I mean, I don't use it. It's not something that I'm on frequently, but I, just don't, I do have an account just to kind of go look at things and, mm. and do a bit of research. Yeah. I ask because I've never been able to to get my head around Weibo. I only use WeChat official right. accounts, so it's just one of those things mm. that's always on my to-do list is, you know, get my head around mm. Weibo, but not today. <laughs> um, some, uh, I think a lot of, um, I say a lot, and um, there's certainly a few organizations that are on uh, TikTok now. Um, I think it's a uh, Kaski, uh, um, which is the um, uh, China Aerospace Science and Cultural Innovation Center. They're on um, TikTok now, I think, and they're kind of, you know, um, making these very interesting videos. I think they're more aimed at, like, um, uh, again, children and, and China's youth. Um, but I just thought that was quite interesting. Um you know, thing to look at if, if you're more interested in um, looking at that kind of way that that's promoted. Well, um, I, I did not know that. Maybe we're going <laughs> to have to get on TikTok yeah. lane and have a Dongfeng Hour TikTok. I'm all for it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Molly, who is your biggest inspiration in the space sector? You can Chinese or not necessarily Chinese? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, 
I there's so many fantastic um, you know people in the, in the space sector, um, and I think you know there's so many people who've done such amazing work, um, amazing research, um, you know journalism, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so so it's really, really difficult to kind of say or pick like one person. Um, there's always one person that sticks in my mind, um, and I think you know her from Go Tyke, and that's Jacqueline Burr. Um, and I met her um, in Changsha a couple of years ago, and um, she was just so nice and welcoming and um, I remember going to this um, this conference and I felt a bit um, overwhelmed you know with uh, kind of everything that was going on I was very new to the the space industry and she was just um, so friendly and and very confident as well and and I think I remember seeing her and how she interacted with people and and I just thought oh that's that's how I would like to be (laughs) you know I'd like to be able to you know um, come at things with that um, kind of confidence but also you know just kind of admit perhaps when I don't know something and you know be able to um you know, just gleam it insight from people who, who do, um, which I thought she was very good at, very good at extracting information from, from other people, um, which is a real great skill. Definitely. And there is a very good reason that we give a special shout out to Go Taikonauts at the beginning of every Dongfang Hour episode, because uh, Jacqueline is indeed quite a quite a person, as is Chen Lan, her, her business partner. So hello to Jacqueline and Chen Lan. And uh, if you're not uh, familiar with Go Taikonauts, to any of our readers or listeners, uh, go check it out. Um, so just a couple more rapid fire questions. Um if they open the borders of China tomorrow, what is the first Chinese city that you would be getting on a flight to? Oh, I think definitely Chengdu. Um, I'd really like to go back. So that's Chengdu. The first, yeah, Chengdu. That's the first um, city I went to. Um, and that's kind of where I, uh, again, like I say at the beginning of this episode, um, I've got an interest in Chinese culture. Um, and I've not been back since, so it's certainly somewhere I'd like to go back to um, and just see how it's developed since I was there. Um, gosh, when was it? I can't remember. I was uh, yeah, over 10 years ago. <laughs> That would have been a very different place, yeah. Um, next next question for me. Do, do you think that um, Chinese pop culture, space pop culture, could ever internationalize? Because we see some, well, less now, but we could we saw many NASA t-shirts, for example, in China. Um, but, you know, do you think we could see Chang'e t-shirts in Manchester, uh, typically? Um, that's really interesting. And I'm not, I'm still quite unsure. Um, I think there's definitely um, a very slow movement towards that from um certain commercial companies um but i think and i think it's very um perhaps reserved um i think um these companies you know might think that there's not an audience really for it yet in um kind of general uh, western sphere um or perhaps not in manchester <laughs> um but yeah, I've certainly seen on um, kind of uh, news websites these uh, you know, kind of government-run websites um, a bit of a you know, indication of these kind of cultural things. So there was a um, uh, sort of little kind of advert um, for this uh, these new Sembo block, you know, kind of like Lego block uh, versions of you know, the Chinese space program and, and the kind of instruments that are used. Um, so I thought that was quite interesting as well, like very little gentle nudge. Um, I think it might be a little while um, until we perhaps see that um, kind of commercialization um particularly with the kind of narratives that surround um the space program you know somewhere like you know in the u.s for example where it almost seems to be like a competitor of of the country um so if you wear one if you wear a shirt you might be seen as a bit of a traitor (laughs) and we definitely cannot have that um so just the the last rapid fire question from my side and then we will transition into the second part of this interview um so what is a, one piece of advice that you would give to a university undergraduate student that wants to get involved in either China or space, or if you want to be very specific, Chinese space? Mm. Um, well, I think um, you know, both of those topics are you know, so big, such big topics. So you've got China, which is an enormous place, um, you know, very difficult to get your head around a lot of different, you know, the language first of all, and then a lot of different um you know, political, socio-political topics. Um, and then, of course, you have space, which, again, is equally as, um, you know, as difficult to understand and complex um, with, you know, the kind of policies and technologies that uh, are involved in the industry. Um, and so so I was certainly coming from, you know, one place you know, I built up, um, you know, some knowledge in China studies and then kind of moved on to space uh, following this um, or the space industry so uh, that was quite a, a, a leap and a change and I, you know, I think that's why I found myself a little bit overwhelmed with all this uh, all this new thing all these new things that I had to learn um, and so I think you know my advice to anybody who is seeking to get into either one or the other or both um, is perhaps you know maybe take it step by step um, you know it, it might seem quite overwhelming you know all these new things that you know, have to get your head around but um I think, um, you know, just, again, 
going slow and not feeling like you have to know everything immediately is, is perhaps the best the best step for that um and just you know just kind of have fun with it um i think often we can get bogged down in um you know small details and worried about um get everything perfect um that's something i'm trying to work on not being such a perfectionist so i think that's something i would i would advise to to anybody and, and i have a last one uh, just related to that how important do you think speaking and reading chinese is to following Chinese space? Mm. Um, I think with the growth of interest um, from Western actors um, and, and the amount of information that is being, you know, is now available to, uh, you know, non-Chinese speakers has definitely, you know, increased um, over the last, you know, several years. And so I don't think it's um, perhaps, you know, necessary um, to, to under, have an understanding of, you know, the kind of activities and what's going on. Um, but I think I'd always encourage uh, people to, to learn a little bit or must learn as much as they can just um, to kind of get the perhaps wider, you know, socio-political context as well um, of uh, of the country. Um, but I, I just think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a great thing to be able to like speak the language and, and understand things, you know, from the source as well and, and make your own you know, ideas or have your own yeah, ideas about um, certain things that are coming out because there's always that filter, that language filter, perhaps if you don't. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's perhaps not necessary, but it's, it's always something I think should be encouraged is essentially <laughs> what I'd like to For say. sure. Well, Molly Silk, some incredible insights on the, uh, the China space culture and on your, your various research. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your time in this first part of the episode. So this brings us to the end of our discussion with uh, with Professor Sill on Chinese space culture. And if you've enjoyed this discussion, <laughs> oh, I'm not I encourage you to, ch- well, uh, uh, associate lecturer Sill, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you, uh, though. One day, I hope. And yeah, and so, um, yeah, if you've enjoyed this, uh, this part one, uh, definitely check out the other half of our interview today with Molly, conducted by the Dongfang Hour media aficionado and newsletter editor Arely Jade on the topic of The Wandering Earth, a recent blockbuster film involving Chinese space. So uh, definitely check it out if you're interested. And thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much.